do want to discuss something that I have been um, mildly entrenched with over the last few days, uh, and those are those are the Edward Snowden interviews. Uh, if you don't know, Edward Snowden has a book coming out, so he's doing a lot of press. The book is called Permanent Record. I have not read it. I will be upfront about that. Um, I have not read the book yet, uh, but uh, I would like to. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can find an audio book version of it, but I don't know if there is one, but I'll figure it out. I'll, 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 I'll see if there is one or not. Uh, it's worth a shot. If there is, uh, leave a comment. Let me know. Um, but I like Edward Snowden. I think Edward Snowden did the right thing. He's uh, in my book. He's a he's a hero a, a, and the, and a patriot uh, for what he's done. Um, and if you don't know what Edward Snowden did, he basically um, leaked information to journalists that uh, showed us that the NSA is spying on everything that we're doing. Uh, from texts, call logs, um, Facebook messages, you know, and, and our data is basically being sold to these intelligence agencies to, to do whatever they want with, uh, basically treating all of us as suspects uh, of, uh, of whatever the intelligence community says that we are suspects of. Uh, and, uh, and that's, that's really a violation that's, a, uh, that's an extension of Bush era uh, politics and uh, that was carried forward by Obama and was handed over to, uh, to the Trump administration. So this, this warrantless uh, wiretapping, this warrantless um, spying of, of the citizens has been going on for a while. He exposed all of this. And, uh, and basically got chastised for it. So I, I'm, I'm going to talk about three different points uh, with this stuff. The first one regarding the Joe Rogan podcast that he did. Uh, I like Joe Rogan. I'm not sure what you think about him, but that's okay. Um, I think Joe Rogan puts out very good interviews and is, and is talking about some important stuff and gives people a platform to really, um, really dig into some of the stuff that they're talking about, right? Like, it's not just sound bites. Like, even his quote-unquote sound bites, like his GRE clips on YouTube, are, like, between 8 and, like, 23 minutes, right? And this, I think the Snowden, uh, the Snowden interview, which, let's, you know, if you listen to the interview, you know that it's not really an interview. Like, it's more of Edward Snowden lectures Joe Rogan about cybersecurity for, like, three hours. Like, that's kind of... That's kind of what it ended up being, right? It was just like it's no like uh, Joe Rogan would ask a question, and then there would be like this very long, involved, dense answer uh, from Edward Snowden. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I, I very much enjoyed it, but it took me a little while to listen to because there's so much information packed into all these responses that he would give. Um, and then, like 15 or 20 minutes later, Joe Rogan would chime in. And uh, and ask another question, and then that and then we would go back into the into the cycle again. So I, I found that very I found that very entertaining. Uh, that it was it was not this back and forth kind of thing that that uh, if you listen to the Joe Rogan podcast, you're you're normally used to. Um, and and doing an interview podcast myself, um, I I tend to ask a question and let the guest talk. Like that's kind of the way that I kind of do things most of the time um and sometimes I have to catch myself to be like you've been talking for like four and a half minutes and you should probably like let this person respond and like have a conversation right like every so often I catch myself doing that um but I try to do my best of letting uh the guests do most of the talking and uh so yeah I uh I very, I really enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed the Joe Rogan podcast interview. But, but, but you know, most of the people that I listen to, that I'm, I'm interested in listening to, um, kind of start with, okay, yeah, the, I'm, I'm supporting them for the reasons that you just described in the beginning of this podcast, um, and then it kind of moves into some interesting things where I, uh, I was like, oh, I didn't know this about this person. It's cool that we're getting a very in-depth look. It's cool that we're getting a very candid look um, at some of these uh, larger political figures or larger uh, 
you know, commentary figures and stuff like that. And we're, and we're talking about stuff that we normally wouldn't talk about um, on, uh, on corporate mainstream uh, media of, uh, of any kind. So uh, that's, you know, that's part of the reason why I enjoy the Joe Rogan podcast. And the one, the, the one major thing, there's so much in that podcast. Uh, but, but the one thing I, I think um, I, I want to point out is, uh, so Snowden comes from, you know, very, very patriotic background of service. He wants to serve his country because his parents work in the government. Um, he, 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 I think he had this idealized view of what America was and what the government agencies were and what the intelligence community was. And he describes that very thoroughly throughout the podcast is like his naivete in all of this. And he's, uh, and he's very unabashed about it. Um, and, and I think you should be right. Like, I think everybody kind of has moments, uh, where, where they were naive. You know, I was naive to think that, uh, MSNBC and NPR were on our side. And, uh, and now I know that's not fucking true. They're just as bad as CNN, Fox News, uh, you know, uh, Rush Limbaugh and, and, uh, and of the like, they're just, they're, they're corporate, uh, state run media. And they kind of they kind of toe the line of what the state wants them to toe the line of. They they push conspiracy theories, um, and they don't care about people. They don't care about re- bringing the objective truth to the people as as what a journalist should do. Um, they're they're bringing a lot of hearsay. They're they're sowing a lot of divide, um, and they are uh, doing things that they can't prove. You know, so so there is a level of naivety that everybody goes through, and then we kind of. Uh, push past that and see the truth and it's impossible to go back to that level of just uh, huh, Rachel Maddow and It's just like fucking Rachel Maddow. Oh my god. You need help. You need to seek counseling You are making thirty thousand dollars a day. I'm pretty sure you can find a pretty good therapist that can fucking help you out um, But that's that's what he described and one of the things he talks about was uh, so he was a contractor. He was not very good at school, but he was a contractor. He ended up being a contractor for the NSA, the CIA, the NSA, and they kind of he kind of bounced around these intelligence communities. Um, and one of the jobs he took was in Hawaii. And uh, basically, the dude that was doing his job before was like, "Hey, kind of just cashing a paycheck here. People have kind of forgotten about my shit. Like nobody cares about this department." So you can just fucking cash your paycheck, log in every once in a while, and then fucking, you know, learn how to surf, sip my ties on the beach, you know, like, whatever you do in Hawaii. I've never been to Hawaii. I, wanna, I would like to go to Hawaii. Um, uh, I, had, I had an opportunity uh, years ago um, that, that um, well, I, I'll say that it, it was... It was an opportunity. It was it was sort of a uh, an, um, a minor offer that got retracted uh, for me to go to Hawaii to perform some shows. I think they had like uh, four or five shows that they wanted me to do, and they asked me uh, what I would want, and it was basically like cover my flight, maybe get a, get me a hotel or a place to stay, um, and then you know if you can offer me some money, seventy five to a hundred bucks for a show, that'd be great. And basically, all in all, that would have ended up being like a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars that this person would have to shell out in order to pay me um and and not know if they're going to recuperate their recoup their money uh so they kind of were just like i think this idea is not gonna not gonna work anyway um but he took this job in hawaii and he basically like you know um was offered this position where he didn't have to do much of fucking anything uh and he decided that that's not what he wants to do. He would he would rather be in service of, of the organization that he's a part of. Um, so that's what he did. Uh, he started working on this thing where he would bridge um, two intelligence communities together so that they could like work more efficiently uh, with each other. They could share information with each other uh, rather than have to uh, you know work through redundancies and. and come up with conflicting results and so on and so forth. Uh, so he's trying to build a bridge between the CIA and the NSA. Not super awesome, but you know, if you are, if you've worked within those communities and you're, and you're someone that is 
trying to be of service to a thing just makes sense. Uh, he discovered some classified information and he didn't kind of know what to do with it. And that was sort of his first like uh, dive into realizing that, uh, you know, these might not be up and up things. These might be, um, the, the, the intelligence community might be up to some shady business. Um, and basically he talks a lot about, uh, on the Joe Rogan podcast about, uh, how, oh, you should read my book, which I get, right? Like you're pitching a book, like you're not giving, you're not going to, uh, you're not going to give away all of it. Like if, when I do interviews, I'm like, I'm not going to give you the material, you know, that's why I, I don't like going on radio interviews a little bit because, uh, they're always just like, do your jokey jokes, do your jokey jokes. And I'm like, I don't. I don't, like, can we just talk like we're people, uh, you know, like that's, um, but, uh, the, the, the podcast was great. He's a very natural storyteller. That's kind of what he does. Um, and, uh, and, and that leads us to the next part of this, which is the NPR fresh air interview. Oh, excuse me. I'm trying to, um, keep awake here. Uh, but he was on fresh air. Uh, which I found very interesting that, that uh, NPR had this dude on, this very anti-establishment, um, you know, anti-intelligence agency person. But the interview was, was uh, you know, was kind of a standard NPR interview. Um, they opened up the interview by basically uh, asking a question about whether he's got allegiances to Russia. Which is, a, which is a bullshit question to begin with, right? Like, this dude was trying to basically serve the American people, discovered that one of the intelligence communities was spying on those people. And because he revealed that information, uh, and is stranded in Russia, by the way, We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, he's like working with this country. He's working with a, uh, a, an enemy of the state. Oh, like, <laughs> what the fuck? And he kind of makes fun of them at, at some point, too, is, is uh, you know, he's, he does talk about how, like, I think we have a Hollywood sense of what what's going on with Russia and everything like that. Um, I think we do, right? And and I think uh, questions like this, uh, especially questions like this that have been debunked, because it's been debunked, he's talked about this several times, that he doesn't have an allegiance to Russia. Uh, it, it, circumstances have, have put him there. Um, this just reinforces those smears and those lies it reinforces that bias that uh, if you're somebody that reveals information if you're a whistleblower of any kind uh, then you must be working for some kind of a foreign state you must be working with uh, you know anti-American interests when when really uh, Edward Snowden and um, any any of these whistleblowers John Kiriakou uh, uh, Hale, Daniel Everett Hale, uh, these are all patriots. These are all standing up for the American people when the government and the intelligence community was not. That's what they're doing. So it just, it just starts to reinforce this bias and it starts to plant this weird little seed in people's minds that maybe he is a Russian spy of some kind. Oh, he's... Are we compromised? Oh my goodness, is this the Manchurian candidate? It's like shit like that. And he's not, and he tells the story, right? He tells the story that when he was, uh, in order to get to, um, he, was, he was trying to get to Ecuador, which is a country that offers asylums to uh, whistleblowers from America. And uh, it's one of the few countries that does. And he was trying to get to Ecuador. And in order to get to Ecuador, he can't fly over any country that America has um, uh, ties to, in a way, because uh, they will ground the plane. Like they grounded the uh, president of the Boli uh, president of Bolivia's plane um, because they thought 
Snowden was going to be on that plane. Like, they were just like, he might be on it! Get that plane off the air! Do it! Get it out! Land it now! And then they had to search a fucking diplomat's plane. Like, that's fucking nuts. Um, so they canceled his passport when he was in Russia because he had to go from Russia uh, to, like, Cuba to another country and then to Ecuador. Um, so it was kind of this, like, hop situation to make sure that they're not flying over any countries that, uh, that America can ground the planes from. Um, and he... Um, his passport gets canceled, and they basically were like, hey, you want to cooperate with us? And, you know, Snowden being part of the intelligence community kind of knew what that meant. You know, kind of knew that what that meant was uh, you want to give us some information. And uh, this is sort of an important note that I think uh, they weren't expecting to hear, uh, is he had, he had nothing on him of the leak. He had given the leaks to the to the to the journalists to, to Glenn, Glenn Greenwald of the Intercept um, and um, and then destroyed it he got rid of whatever he had so he didn't have anything anymore um, and he was kind of which is a smart thing to do I think once you kind of give it to a journalist that you, that you trust and that that you have vetted and uh, why would you keep that shit around it just makes you a target it just makes you an even bigger target He's already a target. Uh, so then they kind of kept him in the airport for 40 days. Like, he was in the airport for 40 days. If he would have made a deal with the Russian intelligence community, intelligence community um, he points this out, he would have been out of there in five minutes put in a limo, but been very well taken care of, and basically been paraded around as the savior of Russia, right? Um, second only to uh, to maybe Putin or something. And so there, there's no, I mean, he's not being paid by the state uh, the way that he, he, he doesn't get like, and then he, can, he that's, that's where he kind of makes fun of them, where he was like, yeah, there's this misnomer, I think, uh, there's this fantasy of, of spy novels and spy movies and, you know, that Edward Snowden's living in a bunker surrounded by these guards and, like, that's how he's living his life. And he's like, I have my own apartment in Moscow. I make my living by do- talking to people and doing these speeches and um, talking about the future of cybersecurity and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, uh, he's free to roam around. He's free to go to the grocery store and stuff. Uh, but they kept asking these questions, right, that, that were kind of these, like, uh, the minor smear question mixed with some of these, like, weird softball questions of, like, do people recognize you? No. Do any, does anybody ask you for selfies? Oh, boy. Snowden selfies. That's an important question to ask you. It's just like, yeah, sometimes, and then I do, and then they're like, thanks, and we've move the fuck on like the, what what it's not a question it's just ridiculous so he talked about uh, something else that's kind of interesting to me as well uh, in terms of uh, in terms of like what his what his responsibilities to the intelligence community was one of the things that he brings up is there is an oath of service that you take not an oath of secrecy the secrecy is uh, kind of like the like an NDA is sort of what it is, is the way that he describes it, right? Like a non-disclosure agreement. It's sort of just you saying, I won't discuss this with the press or write a book about it or what have you. Um, and he has written a book about it and uh, the book is now being suppressed. They're trying to uh, basically try to block the the money that he can make from this book um, to, to support himself. The United States government is basically getting in the way of that. Um, they, they're... they're you know, they're putting a sanction on a person 
is basically what they're doing. They're putting an economic sanction on a person. That's how far this government, like, which is like, wait a minute, if this guy is not really reve- revealing any, excuse me, revealing any information that's like terrible or, or makes the government look like they're doing something unconstitutional, why would you need to suppress this guy? Why would you need to put a sanction on his book where he can't, he can't uh, earn revenue from it? Seems kind of fucking weird. Um, but here's the thing. They don't suppress other people that have been former members of the CIA, the NSA, or the FBI that have also written books about, about their time in the intelligence community, right? But those are, all, those are all books that are approved by the intelligence community. They're all books that go, yeah, they're kind of making it look cool, you know? Can you give it like a Jack Ryan twist? Can you can you describe yourself as like a uh, like a schlubbier John Krasinski or like a like a schlubbier Jason Bourne? Can you do that? That'd be cool. Throw some throw some stuff about ninjutsu in there. That'll be that'll be exciting. That'll get people to read the book and make sure that they don't really figure out what's going on with the intelligence community, how we're violating the Constitution, various different ways. That's, uh, you know, I mean, there, right now there's there's a, a former member of the FBI that's writing smear pieces about a presidential campaign for Newsweek. Naveed something or the other. I can't I can't remember his name, but he wrote a big smear piece about Tulsi Gabbard. This guy gets to go on completely unsuppressed. Doesn't have his revenue blocked. But that's because he's towing the line. He's doing what the intelligence community wants him to do. He's saying what the intelligence community wants them to say. He's not challenging them. He's not telling the truth about what these what 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 these uh, communities are doing. He's not shining a light on the truth. Anytime you shine the light on the truth, you are more than likely to get suppressed. And, And Edward Snowden is proof of that. So the, uh, another question that they ask is, oh, critics, he kept bringing, it up, bringing this up, right? Uh, Dave Davies or something of Fresh Air. He kept bringing up, uh, oh, critics, um, critics have brought up that, uh, you know, perhaps your leak has damaged the state of security in America. First of all, uh, uh, no. has not has not done that um, second of all he he didn't just leak it right like he didn't just go on Facebook and fucking put that shit out there <laughs> you know like he's not like he gave it to journalists who posted? Who, who then wrote an, an article after reviewing the material that he had presented to him? I remember reading the uh, the the intercept piece. It was a very good piece. It was v- it was very. Uh, this is what 2013. So this is six years ago. I was uh, 24. And still trying to wrap my head around what the fuck was going on. And, uh, and I mean, it's a good piece, uh, and they highlight things very well. And even then I was just like, what they're trying to do to the Snowden person is, uh, not great. It seems kind of unfair. It seems like a violation of things, but he did the responsible thing. He, he gave that information to journalists that he could trust. Journalists that were going to do something uh, and, and report the facts of the information without, um, you know, being... Uh, without, without having to toe the line of the intelligence community, without letting the State Department control the narrative. Uh, 
So that's what he did. But and and the, and there's this claim that oh well he he he's ruined national security. Oh, America's security is in danger. Oh no, never been proven. Never been proven to be true. Six years, never been proven to be true. Not once. They're still collecting data. They're still spying on shit. You know? Look at the... In in the last six years, that technology has just gotten more advanced. Right? Like, GPS GPS location services are, uh, you know, um, working a lot better. The cameras have gotten a lot better. And and those can't... I don't, I don't believe that the cameras on the fucking iPhone's 12 megapixel can fucking zoom in to catch a hummingbird's wings flapping properly and, you know, like, you get to see all the details of the colors. If there's a bee suckling on a flower, you get all the details of what's going on with that bee, the individual pollens that are stuck to the bee. Like, that's not because you're trying to help photographers or or, or people become photographers. No, that's so you... the. The intelligence community can have a, a better view of what's going on. They can hack into it and take a better view of what's going on. Get a clearer picture of shit that they don't need a clearer picture for. Because that's one of the that's another thing, right? Is it's this it's this it's this swath of information that they're getting. They're basically casting a wide fucking net without a warrant, and they're grabbing all of our data and they're treating us all like we're guilty. We're guilty of what? Guilty of fucking nothing, really. Guilty of whatever the intelligence community wants us to be guilty of. The thing that he brings up in this interview that I don't think he brought up in the... um, I mean, he might have brought this up in the Joe Rogan podcast. I'm not not entirely sure. Like I said, there's so much in that Joe Rogan podcast. Um, He brings up this thing like, like Google for the NSA... They're basically, uh, when when everything started, this data collection, since 1987. 1987! That's when they started collecting data. Through AT&T. 1987. Which, like, that, even the fucking intelligence community is obsessed with the 80s and 90s, right? Like, there's all these people that have nostalgia for the 80s and 90s, and the intelligence community is right there with them. They're also like, remember leather pants? You guys remember the Ninja Turtles? <laughs> like even the intelligence community is doing that. Forget about, forget about how Clinton was not for gay marriage and put DOMA in place. That was a Democrat that did that. Forget that. But you guys remember, you guys remember that Ninja Turtles movie though? Exciting, huh? Don't. Don't worry about Chechnya or Somalia or why we started all these seven wars because they all went off of the U.S. petrodollar. You, you guys, you guys remember Boy Meets World? Oh man, that Corey Matthews, what a, what a scamper doodle that guy is, huh? Remember, remember that show? Don't worry about how the Bush administration lied about children. Uh, being killed uh, in order to get us into a war that nobody was voting for. You guys remember those wacky adventures that Corey Matthews and Mr. Feeney would get into? Oh, Mr. Feeney. Oh, we love the Feeney. But the Google for the NSA is is, is a real thing. So they basically have this internal system uh, where you can type in somebody's name or phone number or email or whatever and you get a bunch of uh, all, all their data per, pretty much right so uh, call logs um, texts Facebook stuff Twitter all the stuff any data that's stored on your phone uh, or a computer or you know any of these social media sites um, and if they want to look for specific keywords and they want to look for um, you know uh Anything that they find suspi- like they're they're suspicious of, uh, they can pull up anything that you want, anything that you might have said, context or otherwise. Um, 
So basically what this does is it makes, it makes all of the American people guilty before they're uh, proven innocent. You said a thing that the, uh, that the intelligence community doesn't like, uh, so now you are a, uh, a suspect of sorts. That's horrifying. There's no, there, I mean, this is all, this is all just, just random targeting. Uh, it's unconstitutional, right? We have no privacy. Um, and uh, and, it's, and, and in, in a way, th- this is creating a, a cycle of fear that suppresses your speech, right? Like we're not, oh, we dare not say anything. We dare not say anything against the, against the State Department. We dare not say anything about the true history of what the CIA or the FBI does or what the NSA is doing. We dare not say anything about the State Department starting coups in countries that they have no fucking business being in for, to, to take a bunch of their natural resources. We dare not say anything about that because we might get fucked over. That's what Edward Snowden has revealed. All this sort of information. And it's important. So uh, I do want to talk about uh, some of the, the differences between Assange and Snowden. I, I, this is not like a competition of who's, who's got it worse or anything of that sort. This is more of just sort of a, uh, a look at, at, the, at the difference in situation. Because in these interviews that uh, uh, Snowden is giving, he is very um, poised and, uh, you know, he talks about his paranoias and his concerns and his fears and things of that sort. Um, And he's very open about them. Um, But uh, Assange, Assange, not that Assange wasn't, I think Assange was also uh, pretty uh, pretty on point with that sort of stuff. But I I think Assange had a lot more... um, a lot more stuff to worry about there uh, you know um, I think he had he had faced some uh, heavy mental health issues uh, and that were a lot more difficult for him to fight because of the environment that he was in um, and that can that can have a lot of impact on uh, on mental health and and and, uh, and, and you pushing through um, some certain certain negative mental health aspects uh, you know so uh, I think the biggest thing between Assange and Edward Snowden is that Assange, for seven years, was trapped in the embassy in UK. Basically, uh, uh, the Brits said that if he steps out of the uh, uh, if he steps out of the uh, uh, embassy, the Ecuadorian embassy that he was in, he would get arrested and then extradited for sure. Uh, And Assange didn't want that. He didn't want to get extradited and uh, face trials against the Espionage Act, which is also the same thing that Edward Snowden um, uh, would face trials on is under the Espionage Act, uh, which is an outdated law. I will keep saying this over and over again. It is an outdated law. It has uh, no bearing in today's society at all. Um, And it is completely ridiculous. And it, uh, it does more harm than good. Uh, I've done a whole uh, video about it, uh, connecting it back to the, uh, the uh, ejection of Assange from the Ecuadorian embassy, um, if you want to go into the backlogs and, and kind of check that out. Um, but um, yeah, Assange was kind of locked in that embassy. He wasn't allowed to go out. Uh, I, this is a Western nation. A Western nation basically uh, said, y- y- you step out, we'll arrest you. So they kind of forced him into um, in, into this very um, difficult and uh, uh, negative situation, you know, much like they did with Snowden. Um, the United States canceled Snowden's passport and put him in a very difficult situation. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, I think the reason why they did that is to... to uh, to, to be like, oh, see, he's allied with Russia. It's the same thing they did with fucking Assange because he revealed uh, that the DNC was going to try to use anti-Semitic tactics against Bernie Sanders to make Hillary Clinton look good. Uh, and, and they were like, oh, he's, oh, he's right. He's, that's probably Russian. It's probably Russian. No, I think the DNC is just corrupt and uh, a piece of shit organization that should not be controlling uh, any aspect of our election. Uh, what they're doing is wrong and they should uh, they should not be in power to control the election the way that they do 
Uh, so Sanj, for seven years, can't leave this embassy, right? <laughs> kind of trapped indoors. Uh, Snowden, on the other hand, um, can move around Moscow. You know, he goes to the grocery store, museums, things like that. He's not... Uh, he's got permanent residency that uh, gets renewed every three years or, or is up for renewal every three years in Russia. Uh, he applied for it. He makes his own money. He doesn't take any money from the Russian state. Uh, and, uh, you know, he gets, to, he gets to move around. That's huge. Being, being able to do that, uh, in these interviews, he still talks about how he's free. Um, and I think that's a big deal. And, and I think that... Uh, probably helped pull him out of the darkness of the situation a, a little bit easier when you when you kind of have um, the ability to move and to see things and to experience the world. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier to come out of uh, negative mental health spirals. And again, in the interviews, he's talked about uh, the states of paranoia that he would be in. Uh, he wouldn't leave his apartment without shaving his beard. He wouldn't. Um, he would wear a hat. He would wear a scarf over his face so that people wouldn't, you know, like just in case anybody recognized him. And um, so, coming out of that was, I, I think, because of the environment that he was in, um, helped pull him out of the uh, out, out of that uh, paranoid state of mind. Uh, that could have been uh, pretty harmful to him. Um, and unfortunately for Assange, he didn't have that freedom. He didn't have that, uh, he didn't have that basic right. They took his basic right away, and that had negative consequences on his mental and physical health. Um, his eyesight was, was going. Uh, I, I talked about uh, that in a previous video as well, in depth. You know, so if you want to take a look at that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, because of that, uh, you know, his his health is in jeopardy. And uh, Assange was arrested on false charges. They put him in a supermax prison and uh, put him in Belmarsh for skipping bail. That's what they put him in prison for, skipping bail. That's, that's what they put him into a... a uh, a maximum security prison for, and then they want to extradite him and put him into a supermax prison in in the United States. Admax, I think, is where they want to put him when they extradite him. 175 year charge for revealing the truth about American and corporate war crimes, um, uh, corporate fraud, uh, uh, DNC fraud, election fraud. Uh, and he's revealed, uh, you know, things about not just the United States, but uh, all over the world, including Russia. So uh, TPP, they were one of the first people to reveal what's going on with the TPP, and that's a global effort. That was a global effort. A lot of Western countries were involved in that, and that would have basically fucked over the working class. And this guy got arrested for on false charges because, uh, because he got targeted because he revealed this sort of information. And uh, uh, that's uh, not okay. Edward Snowden, once again, like we talked about, uh, says that he's free uh, because he does have the ability to, to move around and um, take care of himself uh, in that regard. And he's currently in negotiation because uh, people have come up and said, uh, well, why don't you, um, why don't, like, would you face trial in the United States? And he said, yes. But I have to be able to tell a jury uh, of my peers, of people from the United States, that of, of why I did what I did, why it was important to me uh, to do what I did. And the United States government's like, no, we're not going to do that. Probably because when people hear uh, why he did what he did, they will go, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. I don't want to be spot on. I want to, I just want to masturbate in peace. That's what I want to do, right? Like, that's, you need privacy in your life. You need, you need moments to yourself. 
Um, you know, I cherish my moments in my car alone. I really do. I value it. Um, sometimes it gets a little lonely, but but I value my time to be a little introspective, to think about um, you know uh, the past week or the past day, the show from the night before, uh, you know something that I read, um, you know personal issues. I cherish that time. I, I, it gives me an opportunity to think about myself, think about the world around me. Um, and run through some things and clear things up in my own head. I think that's important. Everybody should take this time to, to be introspective. Uh, but in a society that, uh, that doesn't really care about people's mental health, eh, who gives a shit? And that's exactly what, what, one of the reasons why the United States government won't uh, let Edward Snowden talk about why he did what he did. Why um, this is uh, a violation of the Fourth Amendment why Dick Cheney was basically saying, yeah, sure, it might be a violation of the Fourth Amendment, but it's fine. Legally, we're in our right to do it. Um, So, you know, Snowden's in negotiation with with what to do. He's not in prison. Um, Recently, there was a couple articles that talked about uh, how Assange is mumbling and, and not, you know, able to form sentences, his, his mind's not all there, and, and it's because the, he's been put through psychological torture. He's been put through psychological torture by being in an embassy, not being able to have basic human rights for seven years, and then he gets put, put into prison, he's a political prisoner, for, for doing nothing, for really what he did, revealing the crimes of the elites, that's what he did, but they got him on skipping bail of a crime that they can't uh, there are too many weird bizarre details that Sweden was like yeah we can I don't we don't think we can do anything about this things are not adding up things are things are weird and wonky and we don't feel comfortable you know having a long drawn out trial and possible extradition like we don't want to deal with it Big thing, uh, I think the distinction that we should also make is um, Julian Assange is a publisher. Julian Assange is a publisher. WikiLeaks is, is, a, is a publication that, that has a 100% hit rate. They've never had to retract a story ever. Um, and uh, Edward Snowden is not a publisher. He was a contractor. He was an inside man. Um, not, not like an inside man like he was sent inside the NSA. No, he was... He was a, an, an intelligence agency insider that knew what was going on um, and had an ethical and moral obligation to say that uh, what the intelligence community was doing was not right and, uh, and turned it over to publishers and journalists. Julian Assange being in prison means that uh, you know they can, they can start arresting other journalists if they want to because they've, they've, they've said things that they don't uh, that the State Department and the intelligence community don't like. Slippery slope. Using that Espionage Act. Slippery slope. Using an outdated law that sh- that that is controversial and uh, and has no basis in our current society. Pushes the idea of paranoia. Pushes this Hollywood uh, fantasized divide of spies and all this other shit. Slippery slope. What this really all boils down to is uh, uh, an intelligence war, right? Uh, as I'm listening to a lot of the stuff um, that that's known as talking about and everything with uh, with Assange that happened, um, what I'm really noticing is that this is a war about intelligence. This is a war about information. Is what it boils down to. Uh, they are mad at these people, the intelligence community, the State Department, um, the governments, uh, that they've revealed information that uh, that they never wanted revealed. They wanted to do things behind closed doors. They wanted to do things in the shadows um, that violated our rights, that, the rights of the people, that, uh, that uh, falsely put us in situations that we should have never been involved in in the first place, uh, that proved that... Um, you know, uh, fraud is being rewarded by wealth. That these people are liars. 
And that's intelligence and information. It's intelligence and information. And uh, one of the aspects of this war is that they don't want the American people to know this sort of stuff. They don't want the American people to know what kind of deceitful things they're doing, you know, how, how they're operating within the shadows. So anybody that has that information, they will wage war on them. They're, I mean, they're literally they're putting an economic sanction on an individual right now by, by suppressing Edward Snowden's book. So, and, and then there's other countries involved as well, right? Uh, I think the Cold War is in a new phase. I don't think we ever really ended the Cold War in any way. We're, it's, it's become this, you know, it's, it's a carryover of the intelligence war. It's about what we can learn about these other countries, get in front of them, and then disrupt what they're doing. Um, meddle in their elections and uh, at, you know so on and so forth and that's been going on between a lot of different countries right like Russia Russia and the United States meddle in so many different countries elections so many different countries politics um, uh, and it's ridiculous it's ridiculous and it's all a buy for power and information they're using information to buy for power um, and uh, look I think information should be shared it should be shared around we should learn the truth we should uh, have knowledge about what's going on and that's for everybody to be shared so that everybody can have the power of that information uh, not just a privy few uh, and and again you know that's what this war is about it's about leveraging information for power and who gets to leverage that information for for what kind of power Edward Snowden Julian Assange Danny and Everett Hale Daniel Ellsberg Chelsea Manning um, reality winner I know I'm probably missing a few Bill Benny uh, if I'm missing any other whistleblowers leave a comment below um, and uh, you know let me know about some more whistleblowers I should look at Christopher Wiley was the uh, Cambridge Analytica whistleblower I just, that one just came to mind uh, but these are people that should be revered they should be revered for revealing who is the, the culprit on this intelligence war? Who is the culprit on, uh, on controlling um, information, on controlling knowledge uh, as a way to manipulate and, uh, and, and, and shift the, the course of power instead of giving power to everybody so that we can all uh, have some kind of voice and some kind of, um, you know, strength in what we're, strength in, in, in uh, building a society that is just and equal and works for everybody so um, yeah we should be we should be celebrating these people not putting economic sanctions on them not exiling them not putting them in prison not calling them criminals and traitors hey thanks for watching this video uh, this is part of a little series I do called road reflections where I talk to you while I'm on tour uh, about the current socio-political environment current news stories uh, debates that sort of stuff that I don't get to talk about on my podcast taboo table talk or fork full of noodles it's a little bit looser and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this clip. If you guys enjoyed it, uh, you can find the full episodes on my Facebook page. Uh, you can go like Krish Mohan, uh, social vigilante and comedian. And uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Uh, share this out if you enjoyed it. Um, and another way to help uh, see more regular content is by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Thanks again, guys, and we'll see you on the road. If you enjoyed the content of this video, there is a very good chance that you probably will enjoy my live stand-up comedy. I'm going to be touring all across the country, so if you are in Atlanta, Charlotte, North Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina, Augusta, Georgia, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Champaign, Illinois, Bloomington, Illinois, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, Minneapolis, Minnesota, I will be coming to your city very soon. You can go get your tickets to come see my live stand-up comedy over at ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com. I hope to see you guys there. Thanks for checking out the video. 
and we'll see you on the road.